We're with Professor Cecilia Vardensch. Vardensch? How do you pronounce your name? Vardensch. Vardensch. Cecilia, uh, what do you do in Sweden? What, what is your job? My job now, uh, I'm currently professor at the Stockholm University, Department of Translate, Interpreting and Translation Studies. Mm -hmm. That's the name of it. And what do you do? I uh, teach translation studies, and I uh, am also. Um, we are now appointing, we, are, we applied to become a research discipline and that's, we, we had the improvement of Stockholm University. It didn't exist before mm -hmm. in Sweden anyway. We, we, there is a lot of master's education and uh, at the bachelor degree education people can study translation studies. But so far we don't have as such a, a discipline a doctoral discipline. Has that think. been approved yet? It has been now approved in Stockholm. That's a battle you have in many European countries. I know, I know. So, um, you so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it. You can be a model for others. Yeah, so, but it's been a long struggle. My colleagues there have applied before. So mm. little by little we are coming okay. up to this now. Your job involves training interpreters. Yes. Translators as well. Translators as well. And I training. mainly have the responsibility of the interpreting yes. section. So we are two professors. Yes. One, my big colleague, Birgitta yes. England Mitrova, she is more into translation studies. And I have the comfort of the interpreting part. What well. about research? Is research part of what your training involves, or is that separate? Well, it, supposedly I have room for or, uh, what do you call it? In principle, I, I should have room for, for research. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully, well, I will have that in practice also. But do you train researchers? Well, we, we, within this master's program, of mm -hmm. course, we have uh, theory and method in, re in uh, research on interpreting and translation. But that's on the master's level. Mm -hmm. Building up a, a doctoral program, mm -hmm. that's of course. You have a doctoral program. We we yeah. are just we we just got approved right, of okay. having it. Oh, I see. You so need the we, research we, area to have the doctoral program. Exactly. Right. Okay. We 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 are involved in research, uh, but all only in connect in, collect, in collaboration with other di with other sure. disciplines. So I have doctoral students in the language department. But they are not in translation studies. Mm -hmm. Now we can have our own doctoral okay. students. Okay. That's the, the big difference. Okay. You're recognized as one of the groundbreaking researchers in, in what's now called community interpreting. Well, Is that not uh, the correct <laughs> characterization? Or? Yeah, well, concerning the, what, what to call it, uh, mm -hmm. it, it has been called. Well, um, community interpreting involves certain areas within the communities, oh. uh, police, schooling, social work, court, uh, but looking at this from, a, from a, as an empirical field, I prefer to, well actually I prefer to call it interpreting. That's good. Uh, be, because there are so much similarities to all different kinds of interpreting. And so, so which term do you prefer? Well, I, I prefer... Just interpreting. To, just interpreting. You use, you applied back to you in your yeah. doctoral thesis uh -huh. and the dialogic principle, the dialogue mm -hmm. interpreting. Yeah. Uh, does that well, make sense as a term? It, it does. And it, uh, I, I think it works fine to, when I want to emphasize this, the, the, the difference between uh, the kind of, of substance you work with mm -hmm. as a, in a face-to-face -face encounter, in, contra uh, in contrary to what a, a conference mm -hmm. interpreter does, does from a booth. So if that's what I'm looking for, to, to make that difference, to, to sort out differences, yeah, I, can, I will use dialogue interpreting. The, the, that's the term Ian Mason then picked up and used mm -hmm. in his edited volumes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that makes perfectly sense. But if we are to build a, a discipline, I 
think it makes sense to talk about interpreting and we try to see what includes in that and, and look for, for similarities. How did you get involved in interpreting studies? And my real question is what were you doing when you were 24, 25 years old? I had just finished my training as an interpreter at uh, then called Kontaktolk, that is well, community interpreting or contact, that's getting in touch. Okay, contact <laughs> speaking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were trained in, uh, in all, what, what would sort under this term of the community interpreting, but also a bit of business negotiation mm -hmm. type of things. And that was, uh, I mean, my, my, uh, my this was language. This was university training. Then. It was this university was, yes. training. At, in in uh, Stockholm? At, uh, actually at Stockholm University. Okay. They mm -hmm. had this uh, um, training for three terms where you applied uh, already with the, with the language combinations, okay. my, my Russian language combination. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I got out and had a freelance experience uh, as an interpreter. Mm -hmm and realized that a lot of things that, uh, that I encountered in reality, we hadn't talked about mm -hmm. in class. So yeah. I thought that, well, that we, why, where is the literature on that? Did you so, went back to do so the I PhD? So I went back, actually I went back to study education and uh, ethnology. Mm. Just well, it was in, in Stockholm. The, uh, it, it was in Stockholm, uh, mm -hmm. and it was you know in the time when you thought you could be just anything. You you, you were not thinking the s strategic way that s students are doing, are more or less forced to be doing nowadays, because you you thought you could get a job anywhere, and you could uh, at the time. <laughs> so I thought it was fun to study ethnography, and. Uh, and that, that gave me some insight into the methods and into looking at different things. Oh, Where did back to income in there? Uh, uh, why income? Oh. In your doctoral thesis, you're, you're drawing on back to you. Yeah, uh, actually, when I, I uh, got a scholarship to study Russian history and I went to Moscow, but I then, <laughs> okay. you know, I, you learn about a lot of things. And, and yeah, right yeah. at the time, uh, the Bakhtin book was published. It had been then in, then in it, Russian. In, in Russian. It was so published under the, the dialogic principle. Uh -huh. Okay, it was Voloshinov as well. Uh, uh, Voloshinov. Yeah. yeah, but that was that appeared in um, Marxist linguistics book. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that appeared earlier. Yeah. So, but it wasn't reprinted in the way that the Bakhtin book was. Uh, and I read it and I didn't understand much. But I had this book and I had a feeling it meant something to me. So I, when I started to study, I joined this doctoral program at Linköping University, the multidisciplinary uh, research institute. Uh, I, I realized that I had something in the back of my head that really applies to this field. Because I joined this program knowing that uh, I, I couldn't do this kind of work, I, this exploration in an, in an ordinary language department. But knowing some of the, the professors there, like Penning and like Pe uh, Robin Sen and Karin Aronson, I knew their work and I knew they, were, they had this broad view on, on communication and language and pragmatics. Mm -hmm. So I thought uh, that could actually be a, a reasonable surrounding and it actually was. I felt very okay. privileged to be in that so Because you see, I remember reading your work, having read Baptine and Voloshino through literary theory. Mm -hmm. This is an entirely different okay. take on yeah, it. Sure. Yeah, of course. Tell me now, what is happening in interpreting studies? What should be happening in interpreting studies? I think uh, interpreting studies would gain a lot by looking more closely into what's actually happening in the interpreting situations and looking really at how language is used 
we are so familiar with translation mm. and interpreting because many of the those who, who work within, within interpreting studies are interpreters or have this language uh, knowledge and you can't do the interpreting studies with, with, without it mm. but that means you have to really distance yourself from what you're doing yourself when you present this research you really need to to have a meta perspective on your own language use in order to really to to find how you are treating uh, data, how you or well, as a researcher as as a researcher yes. you need to I mean reflect upon how you translate your transcripts mm. how you yes. how you put trans right. make transcripts out of of uh, spoken words because mm. that's not our arbitrary it's not true mm. uh, yes something you, you, you th there's no rules about it that every transcript um, brings with it a, a, a theory on, of, of language and communication so when you transcribe you need to uh, I, I think using it's very important to use natural occurring data mm -hmm. and when you use that, you treat it uh, in a conscious way. I would think this is getting back to the ethnographic input, mm -hmm. the ethnographer as translator, and thereby the researcher as a translator as well. Yes, so mm -hmm. uh, but also, I mean, uh, uh, during my, my doctoral t uh, training, I was quite ex inspired also by conversation analysis. I think this could mm -hmm. be done, more, uh, it can give uh, general much, much more knowledge. We have so mm -hmm. many language combinations, mm -hmm. and so many different situations where uh, interpreting is being done. So what kind so of topics would you recommend to people looking for something to do in interpreting, in research? Uh, I think we, we can look up mm, all kinds of of uh, settings, unique settings, and uh, settings that that might not be thought about in the first place when we are uh, dealing with uh, interpreting, um, or nat what is called the book with Brian Harris's mm -hmm. words, natural translating, um, amateurs doing interpreting mm -hmm. or children doing interpreting. Uh, but also the kind of, mm, I think that there's a lot of taking for grantedness within well-established fields of interpreting. We don't see what's actually happening because we think we know yeah, what's is, should is be there happening. A kind of conflict between descriptive research mm. and the, the ideals of the profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they're there constantly. Mm. And that's uh, an additional reason why we need to have this distance from mm -hmm. from the profession. I mean, uh, it's of course it would be a, a waste of effort not to feed research into the uh, uh, to the discipline uh, to the profession. But this uh, there is this discussion of bridging the gap between theory and practice. Mm. I think we should keep them apart. <laughs> I think we should, there's reason for, to to really see that the, uh, if we're going to change something in the practice, we need to take an outside look. So, okay. Cecilia, thank you very much. Thank you.